Good evening, I'm Scott Schaefer, sitting in tonight for Belva Davis, who joins us in a moment from New Hampshire. Here in the studio with me are Amy Standen, reporter for KQED's Science and Environment series, Quest, and Marisa Lagos, reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. But we begin with a special report on the presidential election. Joining me from New Hampshire are Belva Davis and San Francisco Chronicle senior political writer, Carla Marinucci. Welcome to you both, great to see you. Belva, let me begin Thanks, with you. Scott. You've been there uh, on the ground this week. Uh, what has stood out for you? Uh, what have you seen? Well, the fact that I could be here for 24 hours and meet all of the leading candidates, be very up, co up close, shake hands if I'd chosen to do that, did not. Uh, this is a unique experience being in New Hampshire where you have this close um, contact with men who have declared that they want to lead this country. New Hampshire is a unique place. It's 93% white, 1.1% black, 2.8% Hispanic. So, and looking for diversity uh, here, Reporters kept coming up to me asking if they could interview me, hoping that I lived here because it was so hard to find somebody of my color <laughs> here. Wow. And, and if I did, they were usually another reporter. <laughs> and obviously but a very a, different a, kind of a place from California, which uh, is very diverse. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, if we can, talk about uh, the candidates. And Carla Marinucci, uh, Rick Santorum, the former senator, came out of Iowa with a real head of steam. He's the only real social conservative, he would say, in this race. Uh, how did he try to capitalize on that success in Iowa this week in New Hampshire? Well, you know, uh, Belva and I saw Rick Santorum today. He is a staunch conservative. He's really appealing to these New Hampshire voters. But to see him in person, you understand what happened in Iowa. He's a very good retail campaigner. We both followed him around a gun store today uh, in a small town in New Hampshire. It's very interesting, Scott, to see a candidate who can kiss babies in one second <laughs> and uh, admire semi-automatic weapons in the next second. And that goes over well with New Hampshire voters. And uh, does it seem it, that Which he's is why Californians should see what it's like here. Uh, you know, absolutely right, uh, Belva. I think mean, th this is sort of the New Hampshire experience. Santorum is really taking it. Some of the other candidates are also really getting out there, meeting all these voters. And it, it, for that reason, what happens in the next couple of days here is really going to matter in this race. And then, of course, there's Ron Paul. Um, uh, and, of course, so, you know, New Hampshire, the state motto is live free or die. Seems like that would be a great place for a libertarian candidate like Ron Paul. You know, how, how big a splash is he making there, Carla? Oh, well, you know, we saw him in an airplane hangar today, uh, and he turned out huge crowds, twice as big as expected. Uh, he's really going after Rick Santorum. He clearly feels Santorum is his key. Uh, I, I think the most interesting thing that I, <laughs> I uh, discovered today in, in talking to Ron Paul supporters, mostly young people, mostly college-age kids, and I'd say, why? Why have you chosen this as your candidate? They'd say, well, it's his foreign policy, it's his tax policy, and of course it doesn't, uh, I mean, it really helps that he believes in legalizing marijuana. <laughs> yeah, that can so. <laughs> Yeah, and then John Huntsman has been practically living in New Hampshire for the past several weeks. Do you have any sense, Carla, that he's, you know, really getting a toehold there and uh, getting some uh, momentum. That's right, 160 events he's done, Scott, and uh, this is the guy who's rolling the dice in New Hampshire. He is really painting himself as the anti-Mitt Romney. He talked today in an event we were at about yeah, how he is the only Republican candidate who believes in science. Uh, he said that's a concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he talked about how corporations are not people. Uh, a, a jab at Mitt Romney. Uh, this is a guy who has Silicon Valley connections. He was born in Palo Alto. His grandfather was the mayor of Palo Alto. And he talked today about the creative class and innovators and how as president he would make uh, that happen, the job creation in among Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. And, Belva, and he's I know made that you a were... personal commitment of his time. Right, but he's made a personal commitment of his time uh, here in New Hampshire. Whereas, you know, the Mitt Romney campaign obviously has been spending money. They're the most professional looking group in terms of having the things we're accustomed to looking for, not folksy at all in their approach to campaigning here. And, Belva, I know that you attended uh, uh, a Romney event uh, this week as, as well as others, but uh, describe that for us. What was it like? Was he, was he loose? Was he comfortable? It, he, he appeared with John McCain, and so you had to first get used to the chemistry between the two of them. And then after that, I mean, it was all pretty much scripted. He is, he is really the most...
professional sounding of the candidates that I've seen. And Scott, I have to say, uh, you know, I saw him tonight at a spaghetti dinner. He is trying to paint himself as connecting to the common man, but he keeps getting these rich guy questions. Tonight he was asked by an audience member about the three homes he owns, including that one in La Jolla, uh, seaside mansion that he intends to quadruple in size. Those questions keep dogging Mitt Romney here in New Hampshire. And, and Belva, I know that you spoke to voters uh, while you were there at a Romney event and a Santorum event. Let's uh, take a look and hear what they had to say. I actually was leaning towards Romney coming in here um, because I believe he has a vision for what this country can be. He's not so focused on the present more than he's focused on the vision for what this country can be. In 2007, I had, myself and my family have a company. We had 49 people working for us. Now we have seven people working for us. So it's very important for me to see somebody who has that background get elected president of the United States. I was leaning toward Ron Paul, but I think I'm going to follow Rick. I'm impressed. <laughs> and uh, so we, they go on. Uh, Tuesday is the primary in New Hampshire. They go on then to South Carolina, Florida, Nevada. What about us in California? Is there going to be any role for California voters, uh, Carla, other than, you know, giving them the money they need to run their campaigns in another part of the country? Well, Scott, so much will depend on how Mitt Romney comes out of here in New Hampshire. The expectations are so high. Uh, he's expected to win by more than 20 points in some of these polls. If he doesn't, there, then he has to worry about the uh, storyline that he is a weak candidate with not a lot of enthusiasm among the GOP voters. And then we're talking about something that possibly could go on. Uh, to Cal all the way to California, watching a Republican battle. If uh, Santorum tries to coalesce that uh, uh, conservative base, the Gingrich people and the rest of them that are out there, Perry's people, uh, who knows what could happen? Maybe California could have a play finally. Bob. Yeah, I, I think one thing, we won't hear the scripts we're hearing here when they get to California, because uh, we hear things from candidates like, we must do something about Social Security. We have to cut it. We need to get rid of Medicare. Uh, there are, you know, pledges uh, to allegiance to the Second Amendment, gun rights. I don't think we'll hear those kind of things in California, which is why it's so important to be introduced to New Hampshire and to see how they are put on record with some positions that won't play well in the West. All right, well, Belva, Carla, That's thanks right. so much. Great to see you tonight. Uh, stay warm, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. All right. Well, the presidential politics and the campaign sort of got eclipsed this week here in California. Marisa Lagos, the governor, somewhat precipitously uh, <laughs> had his state budget released, or he released it. Both are true, actually. Tell us about that. What were the highlights? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to what you're alluding to in a second here, but uh, Governor Brown did come out yesterday. He talked about this uh, estimated $9.2 billion shortfall, which is, of course, a huge amount of money, but far less than we've seen in years past. Um, nevertheless, he's proposing massive cuts to social programs. Uh, CalWORKs, the Welfare to Work program, would get about a billion dollars whacked. $71,000 or 71,000 uh, child care slots for poor families would be eliminated. We're looking at about almost a billion cuts to Medi-Cal as well. So really have choices, I think. Um, and this also assumes on, that voters will pass his $7 billion tax plan next fall. So, um, if it, that doesn't happen, Brown came out and said, kind of out of the box, we will then cut school funding by almost $5 billion. We will slash universities by hundreds of millions of dollars more. So a lot of uh, threats almost yeah, well, <laughs> so so attached to this budget Someone package. described it as kind of a ransom note, a political yeah. ransom note. You'll pass these b b ballot measures or else, you know, this, this, and this is going to get cut, which, but it, it may well, right? Which it's it not, is, and he's I, not making it up. He's not. And I think that, you know, we saw this last year to a certain extent. Um, just before the legislature came back from break, the governor had to decided to pull the trigger on these automatic cuts mm -hmm. that they had instituted last year as part of the budget deal. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's not unreasonable to think that he will move forward with these cuts, but it's also going to depend on a lot of timing. The governor wants the lawmakers to pass this uh, budget and all these cuts included in it by March. Democrats aren't having that. They're saying we don't want to do anything until May when we know the updated revenue figures. Um, and and there's a reason that's important. Four billion of that nine billion dollar shortfall is kind of rolling over from this year, and uh, it looks like if 
that that's the amount of cuts that would happen. So I, so they're in no hurry to to see that they happen. Don't they would they would it. like to wait longer and they see what the voters do. Well, I think they'd like to wait longer and see how tax revenues come in, and also um, yeah, see I think what the political climate is like. You know, we have a very unsure sort of terrain this year for candidates. It's the first year with the top two primary mm -hmm. uh, redistricting has taken effect. So I think there's going to be a lot of nervousness in the Capitol among Democrats to vote for this budget. Can you explain exactly what happened with the release of this budget? Yes, and, I we'd get and, that. and was it embarrassing for for the governor? I mean, or, or what? I mean, what happened? What went wrong? So, uh, yeah. Um, and just explain. As, yeah, let's, 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 kind of an let's insider back thing. up a second here. So every year, the governor has to release a budget plan mm -hmm. by January 10th, and this is sort of the start of budget season. Um, the governor's office had sent out a press release saying that they were going to be doing it at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, which is the 10th. Everyone was preparing for that. Uh, at about 12.45 on uh, Thursday, we all got a call saying from the Department of Finance, those of us in the Capitol Press Corps, saying, get over here at 1.30, you're going to want to be here. Uh, within the next 10 minutes, we had gotten a press release from the governor saying, we're going to release the budget at 2.30, and uh, his spokesman actually took to Twitter to tell all of us it was because somebody had accidentally posted it online quite early. Somebody meaning? Somebody in their staff. On their staff. To, any any word on what happened to that of, person? <laughs> it's not clear. They, they were sort of hedging yesterday, saying, it, you know, we know who it wasn't, but we're not sure yeah. who it was. So, but, but they but, did have to scramble. Well, but you know, that said, Jerry Brown, whether you like him or not, is pretty good on his feet. I mean, he knows the state budget inside and out. Yes. And he, in some ways, maybe it gave him, do you think, seemed like, you, you know, he was kind of enjoying reveling, kind of going with it, you know, kind of improvising on the, on the run. Yeah, this is not a scripted governor anyway. I think that we did see there might have been a couple more talking points they would have prepped him on, but I think he seemed very relaxed at this press conference. He always speaks sort of off the cuff. He enjoys that. Um, and, and I think that given the sort of tone of this year's budget with the fact that, you know, after years where we needed a two-thirds majority in the legislature to pass a budget, this is not only, you know, last year was the first year the Democrats could do it on their own, but this is the first time ever in recent memory that we're, they're not asking Republicans to come on board for taxes. And just mm -hmm. quickly, uh, the governor had no success with Republicans in the last uh, session. Uh, is he going to try to work with them this time around? Is there anything that he I really needs their votes he for? Not have to. He doesn't need to. And I and I think, I mean, he said things. He'll, he said recently he'd go out with them if they're buying the drinks. So I think that gives you an ind indication of uh, where so things are at in the Capitol. So he feels that he went yeah. the extra length and they didn't meet him halfway. Yeah, and, and again, they don't, he doesn't need them. He's going straight to voters mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. Well, Governor Brown, uh, remains uh, pretty steadfastly mm -hmm. uh, behind a plan that's in a lot of trouble this week. I'm it talking is. about high-speed rail, yeah. the bullet train. Uh, Amy Stanton, tell us what happened, another log on the tracks. Uh, what was yet, it exactly? Right, the puns keep coming. When, <laughs> yeah, when you cover high-speed rail, no, is it going Calamity. off the tracks? Is it? Uh, what happened is on Tuesday, um, the peer review group, which is sort of a built-in panel of, of transportation experts, released a report saying that it would be essentially wise and actually deeply risky for the state to get started on high-speed rail without a firm sense of where the rest of the money is going to come from. The state has right now enough money to start the first segment of rail, which is this much derided rail to nowhere between Fresno and Bakersfield. Um, but that's six billion dollars on an overall price tag of 98 billion dollars and it's not entirely clear where the rest of that money is going to come from and that makes a lot of people really nervous and this panel how much credibility do they have are a they lot. real they yeah. do this is a well respected panel that has not been i mean this project has has just been kicked over and over again but not always by this panel this panel has been critical of ridership estimates and a, a few other things but this is a well-respected um, group of people with a long history in transportation um, and uh, you know their their concerns um, are, 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 are a real blow to the authority I mean, the authority came you know right back out kicking saying you know this is this is unfair it's wrong these people don't know what they're talking about they don't have the high-speed rail you know expertise that but they we do, do. Don't they? <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, there is no high, yes, but there is no high-speed okay. rail system in this country, yeah. so, you know, how well do they know? Uh, but they're the, not politicians. They're I mean. not politicians. And no, it's people like Will Kempton, the former head of California's Department of Transportation. So it's, you know, people with long transportation histories, but maybe not high-speed rail So histories. beyond that, I mean, the legislature has a choice this year whether to approve almost $3 billion in, in bonds, bonds for this, right? right? Congress has been making noises, the Republicans. Mm -hmm. How much of this is just politics? I mean, it seems like Democrats are on one side and Republicans are on the other. In, in in Congress too, not, not just yeah. Oh uh, not yeah, just no. This, this what's 
the, the fear here, I think, on the part of the authority, and, and they'll, they'll say this, you know, is that this is sort of runs the risk of becoming really deeply ensnared in election year politics. Um, Obama came in with, um, you know, as a big supporter for high speed rail, wanted to put $6 billion in the 2012 budget for high speed rail. The Republicans took that out. Um, and so, you know, it, it is very much a political issue. At the same time, I mean, the, this is money that we either have or we don't. And the big question is whether or not the state can break ground by October 2012, because that's the deadline to qualify for stimulus money. Now, and the voters did authorize $10 billion yes. in bonds yes. in 2008, but I think it was. that money is contingent on having some kind of match from ideally federal dollars. Yeah. Um, but we lose that federal money if we don't make the October deadline. And Republicans want us to lose that money regardless, right? I mean, there's noise in No, Congress. yeah, they don't want a successful stimulus program, I think, at least some of them. So, well, um, Or do they see it as a boondoggle? Or do they see it as kind of a road, you know, tracks to nowhere kind well, of Well, I mean, this is money that is going to build initially 130 miles in the Central Valley. Um, it's not really enough money to have a fully operational high-speed rail even between, even in that limited sense. It's really just building a better set of tracks for Amtrak. So is that initial project going to generate the private investment that the project needs to build the full, you know, San Francisco to LA span. Um, you know, these are these are not just political concerns. I think to come back to your question, these are very real financial concerns, and you're he hearing them from both sides. Oh, I was just going to ask, what's your? I don't know if you've reported on this, but in the Central Valley, is there support for this? I know a lot of lawmakers there mm -hmm. don't like it, but. There's the been there some, like yeah, there's been some support, but recently, um, or I think it was about six months ago, you know, a lot of the, the lawsuits had been on the sort of northern and, and southern part of the routes around L.A. and the peninsula and then outside of L.A. Um, recently, there's another lawsuit in Kings County now. Um, farmers say that this is going to, you know, I think it's fair to say it will, you know, uh, <laughs> right get there. rid of some farmland there, some valuable farmland. Um, there's concerns just everywhere about, you know, where you're going to put these tracks. And then just quickly, Amy, uh, is there was some talk that maybe this would go back before the voters, because the voters yeah. seem to be having second thoughts. Yeah, LaMalfa, um, a Republican state senator in Northern California, is... Um, wants to have this put back before the voters, which wouldn't go well for high-speed rail authority. At least there was a field poll a couple months ago that found about two-thirds of the state wouldn't support it. Well, there is another train leaving the station, and we need yes, to get on us. it. So <laughs> thank you both very, very much. Thank you.